Okay, so what we want to what we want to have for today's lesson is we're going to produce uh, we're going to produce bamboo models of your of a structure, um, and the bamboo model needs is going to be basically rationalizing everything into straight lines because uh, the bamboo elements that you'll be using are going to naturally want to warp into being a straight line. They're, like if you bend them, they'll bend back. Um, but we need some way of connecting the, the bamboo together. So if we imagine each of these elements is a bamboo rod, then the, these little red elements, the nodes, uh, will then connect those rods together. Whoa. Why, 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 whoa? Okay. So um, we can actually, what, what that means is we can make our, we're going to actually have to make our model a lot bigger than what we've been making it. So this is making something like this at this scale is going to be really difficult. And the larger you make it, the easier it's going to be. Okay? Um, also, a really cool thing about this is that um, it will, hopefully be like if you don't glue it together you can disassemble it and um, like carry it around basically as a little bag of nodes and a bunch of rods so it's quite transportable um, so that works there so what we need uh, what part of this particular process um, you can see that we've got colors uh, throughout the model can anyone have a guess at what those colors might represent? Different sets. Different what? Sets, sets of what? <coughs> Different lengths. Different lengths. Okay. But so if I were to if I were to start dividing our surface up and putting lines between points on our surface, what like do you think we'd get a standard length of of elements? For example, if I were to draw a cylinder and I were to <clears throat> divide this line evenly, do you think that if line A, B and C, do you think they're all the same length? Yeah. Because I divided it evenly, right? Um, and if I were to start, you know, dividing the circle up evenly, do you think that would be the same length? These, uh, so lines 0, 1, 2, and 3? Yeah, like they're, they're the same length as each other, but do you think they're the same length as A, B, and C? Like they, they could be a different length, right? But if you've got a geometry that isn't uh, developable, then what hap when I go to unwrap it, if I go to try and make it out of paper, what happens? The paper will rip, yeah? So what that means is if I were to draw a line on that and then unroll it, the lines will have to get longer and shorter, like the like they're even distances. So it's highly unlikely that you can you can get a standard set of of lines through. And you'll you'll note that there's probably a pattern here. You can see the banding. So there's a blue band, a uh, cyan band through the middle, then a green band, then a yellow, red, and then purple at the end. So uh, if you divide your surface in a certain way, it's likely that your lines will be uh, the right, like the same length all the way along. But what we, what you guys are going to have to do is cut these out of bamboo, right? So if if there's how many lines are there? Ninety four. So there's 200 lines here, yeah, and you need to cut them manually, so you have to cut 200, and if each one had to be 10.253 mil, exactly, and the next one had to be 10.45 mil, then the next one had to be 15.32 mil, the things start, things start to sound a bit complicated, right? But if you only had seven different sizes to cut. So let's say 
10 mil, 15 mil, 20 mil, then if I wanted you to cut 10, 10 mils, like you just have to line it up, cut, line up, cut, line up, cut, line up, cut, line up, cut, right? Have you guys been introduced to some of the tools in the workshop? Like the drop saw? So like you can set up jigs in the drop, drop saw to cut certain lengths, yeah? So what we need to do is we're going to lay a line network across our surface. We're going to standardize the lengths, very similar to how we tried to standardize our panels for the National Maritime Museum of China, yeah? We tried, tried to find panels that are very similar to each other and truncate them so that they're the, the same. But then we have to 3D print uh, nodes, custom nodes that hold them all together. So each node is going to probably be unique. And one of the issues with these nodes, if I were to print something like this in the 3D printer, what is the 3D printer going to do to that? It's going to do what? It's going to, it's going to piece. What's it going to do? It's going to put a support structure. So it's going to put support structure in there, right? Yeah? So if I were to, if we're doing nodes that bamboo sockets go into and they're printed on the side like so, yeah, then it's, and that socket is where the bamboo goes, what do you think the 3D printer is going to do inside that node? It's going to put support structure and that's where the node, that's where your rod needs to go. So we're using five mil, yeah, five mil bamboo, and there's potential that this is going to put in support structure, and this is where I, this is the thing that I mentioned, and what we were checking prior, prior, just to see if it was going to put support structure in. So uh, the solution for you guys is that if it does do support structure, you're going to have to drill it out. Okay. So some of them might. Some of them might not do support structure, some of them will definitely do support structure. Because these are shaped like this, yeah? So you could put, potentially print one like this and avoid support structure in the, like the top one, but these two will then have support structure. So it's almost unavoidable. There are ways of getting around it that I've come up with, but the, it, it, it's a slightly more complicated design, I mean, design and construction process. Cool? So what we're going to do first is I'm going to just use a base geometry, but I expect you guys to be using your own geometries. And remember how we extruded the surface to do the waffle? We don't need to do that. We just need to use a, a infinitely thin surface. We don't need to use a B-Rep this week. Like you. <laughs> So, Yes? Um, it will, but it probably won't produce the form that you're looking for. It's going to look, just look like a dome. Like, yeah. Well, you would have to put the points exactly on the peaks. So I would do it for the shell for now. There are ways of doing it for the dome, but the dome will end up being like this big if for it to work properly. How was the Avengers? It was good, I enjoyed it. Okay. 
Pardon? Yep, so all we want, we all you need is something that looks like this. Huh? So what we're going to do is we're going to create a line network across this. Now there's a few ways of doing it and Christina's done it by slicing lines through the geometry. But I want to I want to show you guys something that might have a bit of fun because we've already sliced geometry, yeah? Like we've already done it. Yeah? Mm. But the so the key thing with this is that if I were to slice through the surface what would it produce? Okay. Curves. It would produce curves, right? Unless we slice it in a really specific direction, then it would produce lines, yeah? Because yeah. it's a hyperbolic paraboloid. Yeah. But if we slice it, is, there's highly unlikely that it won't be, it'll be curves. So, and the process that we need to produce this is going to make truncated lines, yeah? So, what would happen is where, wherever two curves meet, you would effectively make a node and another node and then you would end up having a straight line in between. And what we would have to do is start producing lines between them. Should we do that? Hmm. Because I feel like if the way that I teach you, you guys will be able to do some pretty cool things. Let's do cool things. Okay, because the way Christine is doing it, it means that it's you're only likely to have uh, four bamboo elements coming into the one node. But the way I'm going to teach you, you could have like 10. So you could do like a hexagonal grid going across made of bamboo. Or you could do a, a, um, a diagonal grid. Or you could do a Voronoi grid, whatever grid you want. So let's do that. Okay. So in that case, first thing we need to do, um, we need to understand that this is a surface and how many how many sides does a surface have four. four think back two weeks get back in the groove yeah how many weeks have we got to go this is week eight nine it's only got four weeks to go okay okay so this is a surface how many how many sides does the surface have four um if i were to draw a surface that looks like this and a surface that looks like this and we call this U and this V and this U and this V. I really struggle making my Vs look um, for the same, uh, different. Um, that's why I probably struggle. Um, so if I were to pick uh, U at 50% and V at 50%, where's, where's Jamie? Okay, good thing I'm recording. Um, if I were to pick U and V at 50% on the surface, and I were to do the same thing with our second surface, where would the, where, roughly where would the point be? Like if we go 50% along U, in the center. Base, not really the center, but it would roughly be there, right? So what I can do is I could draw a smiley face on this surface, and I, I could technically map that to the exact point on the other surface, okay? So when we draw patterns, tessellated patterns, it's really easy to do them in 2D. So if I were to say, okay, let's draw a square grid, easy, right? But if I were to say, okay, I'm going to give you a sphere and I want you to draw an evenly square grid on that sphere relative to its U and V coordinates, it's a mind fuck, right? Especially if it's a hyperbolic paraboloid, not a sphere. Yeah? Does that make sense? So, if I were to take my surface, and create uh, and untrim it. That'll tell us, okay, that's where the that's where the actual surface, the four-sided surface, goes to. Yeah, and because I've got it in top view, it looks nice and neat, but it's actually nice and parabolic. Cool. Yes. Oh, you want uh, you want bifocals? It's the best plugin, isn't it? Yeah, for for teaching. 
So we want to untrim. And what do we know, know about this? Remember how we actually trimmed this? Because we actually had a parabolic surface previously, yeah? It, and it went that whole way. We actually drew, that's actually something that we drew. And untrimming it, um, I mean, we trimmed it. So in a way, we're just, oops, we're just actually using that original surface. It's still there. So we've got a surface. Uh, we know it's four-sided. If we measure the uh, sides of that, we should get a rough idea of, of the length and breadth. And surfaces can do things like this, right? They, they could be hourglass. So I could measure the length of this and it could end up being like five by 10, but in the middle it's actually like two, yeah? But in this case, we've got a fairly uniform surface. So if we were to create a rectangle that represent, it represents this, it would be pretty close to what we want, yeah? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna analyze the surface and we're gonna get the dimensions. And this, this is a rough, it's approximate, right? It, even the output of it says it's approximate. So what that does is it gives you the length and breadth of the, is that good? Yes. Or do you prefer this? No. This is better? Yeah. Okay. Actually, if I do this, I can turn the brightness down on my screen, which means that my battery will last longer. Okay, so what this is giving us is a x and y dimension, uh, u and v dimension. So the v, the v is obviously the shorter one. So if I plug this now into create a rectangular surface, um, and by doing so we want, I think it's under primitive plane surface. So we're producing a nice planar rectangular surface. And what this is gonna be is a 2D analog of our 3D surface, okay? And I think what's going to help, um, can you guys, can you guys kind of guess where this sh shape, am I in the way? Sorry. Can you guys guess where this shape would go on the rectangle? Can you have a fairly good idea? It's a bit, tr it's tricky, right? You don't know exactly where it would go, yeah? So what we're going to do is we're going to grab the, like as I go from 2D to 3D, I can actually go from 3D to 2D. So the process, what we're going to do is we're going to take the edge of our surface, we're going to work out where the coordinates of that edge sit in th on the 3D surface as UV coordinates, and then we're going to draw those same coordinates on our UV of our 2D, and then we can actually know where the edge is so that we can produce a pattern in 2D. Okay? Uh, well, it, it'll, all, it'll all come to fruition. So, if I quickly grab a B-Rep edges, and I grab that from our surface, what that'll do is it'll give us uh, the, the surface edges that we've trimmed, that we've used to trim. And in this case, there's actually quite a few. There's five of them. So there must be one, two, three, four, five. Then we're going to divide the, these by, let's say 10. So let's, let's stick with the, the number that we want, uh, that, that it's given us. Why did they do this to me? Cool, so we've taken the B-Rep edges, we've divided them. Then, if we use a process called closest point, uh, so surface closest point, what that does normally, if you were to do closest point uh, with curve, surface, or um, mesh, uh, let's say surface for now. Uh, so if this is our surface and we have a point over here, what that does is it finds where on that surface the closest point is, and 
you, what that will also produce is uh, a 90 degree or normal uh, direction onto that surface. So anywhere, anything that is closest, that will always end up being normal. Everyone familiar with what normal is? I'm not normal, but not that type of normal. Okay, so everyone's familiar with perpendicular? Yeah, okay. So anything that's, per th this would be perpendicular if it's 2D, right? All normal means is perpendicular in three dimensions. So that means that on a surface like this one, that an element that's normal is perpendicular in every direction on that surface. And every surface can, has normals. So there is no such thing as a non normal on a surface. It's always possible to have a normal anywhere on a surface. Okay? Excellent. So what this process does, if we plug our, our points in to our, our surface, what it's going to do is work out where the closest points are, but our points are already on our surface. So we're not actually using this to uh, find the closest point. What we're actually using it for is the output that it gives us which is a UV value on, on our surface. So you note that we're getting a number 363182 from our UVP. If I were to right click our surface and reparameterize it, then that guarantees that the numbers that we're, put, we're getting out of it are between zero and one, okay? So the first point that I'm getting here, um, what percentage What's, what's its U value? What percentage along U? So if I, were to, if I were to draw this on this particular surface that I've drawn up here, what's the U value? Can everyone see it? Corky, what's the U value? Of the very first point, what's the U value? So just to remind everyone, in world space, we have X, Y, and Z, yeah? So in a Cartesian coordinate, I could say 25 meters X, 25 meters Y, 25 meters Z, and that means I'll have a point, you know, roughly that way. But in surface space, we use U, V, W. So, is the U coordinate, right? Now, if I were to put this on here, where would the, where do you want me to put it on this line? 0 0.76. What, what coordinate do you think this point is on you? Zero. Yep. And then what's this point? One. Exactly. So then 0 0.75 would be roughly here. Yeah. And then the other one? What's the sec, what's the second values? So what is that relating to? V. So the V would be 1. So U and V, 1. So therefore, that point is represented there. Yeah? And what I reckon is, that point, just by looking at the UV value, is probably either this point or this point. Because it's, it's in an extreme. So that if this is 0 and this is 1, or let's go the other way, this is, yeah, sorry, if this is 0 and this is 1, then that point there is 1, yeah? And look, it's roughly 75% along the line. Yeah? Okay, so, if we evaluate a surface, and we use our plane surface to evaluate, And we use these UV coordinates. Now, we j just remember, we want to reparameterize. What that'll do is it'll map the points that we have in space, 3D space, onto our 2D surface. Yes? Why do you use UV, W, 
because XYZ is specifically for uh, non-bending space. So space that couldn't possibly bend. And UVW is used for space that can bend. So it, it really comes, like, uh, a lot of you guys will probably uh, be familiar with video games. Yeah? Um, and the way that we texture uh, characters in video games is we need a flat 2D image that gets wrapped around the character to give put the details where they need to go. And those images are called UV maps, which are relating to that curved... It's a 2D map that is wrapped around a 3D object. So there are UV coordinates on a 3D object. So I could say... If I were to say this is UV coordinate is 70, 0.75 and 1, that point also has an XY coordinate. And what it does is it avoids confusion between the two. Cool? Whenever you put a plane in Grasshopper that, and you want to put a point relative to the plane, it will always treat that plane as UV and W uh, coordinates. So it just separates the two. Yes? Uh, is it the planes? So some of you might see uh, crazy grids everywhere, which are these planes. Uh, it's just because your display, uh, the preview plane size is set to a number that makes them really big. So if you go display preview plane size and set that number smaller relative to your model, that'll, that'll look better. Now, we could draw lines from this, but it's, it's pointless because we're not actually going to use them. We'll just use these points as a guide for now. What we need to do now is produce a grid or whatever we want. So there's so many ways of doing that. We could draw it manually. We could produce a random Verona grid. It's really up to you. You guys can find grids uh, under vector grid. There's a hexagonal grid, a radial grid, rectangular, square, triangular, um, and then if you guys want to look at Voronoi grids, there's um, Voronoi under mesh. So what Voronoi does, um, or you could use Delaney, but if you put multiple points in, so if I go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and I put these points into our Voronoi, then it produces a cell structure that where the, the, these lines are centered between their neighbors. But that's for you to explore, okay? What we need to do, at, what I'm gonna do is just use a square grid. Um, and I think the key point with this is, you, you guys can place it wherever you want, but if you, put it, um, let's just hide everything but the surface, the evaluated points and the grid. We can see there's, there's my grid there. So if I did a square grid, we've got a point where it starts, a plane where it starts, a size of the grid. So if I jack that up, Um, and then can anyone guess what e, X and EY is? Guess, is, can anyone, you know, say what it is? Number. Number of what? Uh, of the grid in X and Y direction. Perfect. If you mouse over things, guys, it'll tell you what they are as well. Just remember that. So that will give us a number with X and Y. So we can now... Like I've been very rough with this, um, and I, uh, but there are like there are ways to actually work out how to make a nice even grid across that um, surface. But you guys can work that stuff out by yourself. Okay. Cool. So what that should do is it should give us a whole bunch of square or uh, square lines, polyline curve. Yep. 
So these, the curve output of this is going to, actually let's make this a bit smaller. Let's make it 500, uh, sorry, 50. And let's double that, so 26. Okay, so one of the, I guess one of the important things here uh, is gonna. This is the one thing that's gonna screw you guys up. You're all using Kangaroo two, right? I mean, you're using Grasshopper six, yeah? I mean, let me just wake up. You're using Rhino six, right? Excellent. Good. That means you should all have Kangaroo, yeah? Kangaroo two. Excellent. Okay, I've just solved half an hour's worth of work. Not so they've solved half an hour's worth of work. Okay, so an important thing here is that we want to make lines. Like we want lines that come out of our, um, that we're using for bamboo. Um, and in this case, if we look at one of the shapes that this thing creates, it's a, it's a closed square, yeah? And we don't want that because what that means is the square next to it means, is actually producing another line like there, yeah? So what we want to do is we're going to break all our curves up using explode. We're going to flatten the system. And we're going to run it through this kangaroo component called remove duplicate lines. Uh, this one. And what that will do is if there are two lines that overlap each other that are exactly the end at the same point, so they're collinear and they, they have uh, the uh, same endpoints, it will re remove in all of them but one. So that will mean now there's only a line that goes, there's only one line that goes between these two points instead of two. And you'll need to do that for um, all of the grid, grid processes, including the Voronoi, um, the only one that you won't have to do it for is the Delaney process, if one of you wants to do Delaney. Uh, I'll do it the what? Mine doesn't show, so the grid doesn't show? Yeah. Is your size of the grid yeah. too small? I have like 70 something. If you, if you preview the grid and then select it, middle click and then select the zoom, it'll zoom your view to the grid. Do you have to select the main to? No, it's, is it orange? Is your component orange? Red. Red? Have you got one of your numbers set to zero? Have you got one of your numbers set to zero? No. You did. You did have it set to zero. <laughs> Yes. What does? No, you only need to plug that into the, the C. The R doesn't matter. It's the wrong one, man. Yeah. How come you don't have kangaroo? You don't have kangaroo? I'm using the file. Ah. Yes, I'm gonna download. I mean, I don't know why we do the same procedure, but there's no showing like that. Did you? May I see? Yes. Ah, you are. Um, you've made a. You've made your hyperbolic paraboloid. Um, a single surface. That's fine. So what that means is that your surface is exactly the hyperbolic paraboloid. Yeah. That's fine. Oh, that's okay. Yep. Oh. Your grid's really big though, so you should make your grid smaller so that it fits on the surface, on the, this one, this surface. So how can I see this grid? It should be like it should fit on it. You'll see. Uh, you'll see why soon. Okay. So uh, you don't need to. You can do whatever you want. 
Like I have a, a quarter of my shape. Oh, okay. Make the grid bigger. Make it bigger. Doesn't okay, guys. So, guys, I'm not being look. I'm not being very accurate. I'm gonna. It's up to you to end up being accurate later in class, like after class, okay? Because there's just too much to cover, okay? I don't. It doesn't really matter because being accurate with this geometry is actually going to be messy because uh, these this grid's not actually going to line up with the edges anyway. Yeah. So we can like we can be a bit messy with this grid. The key thing is I need to make sure that you've all got some form of lines, more than one, going across your surface and making sure that you've exploited them and removed duplicate lines. Okay? Because what we're going to do with these, these duplicate lines is we're going to find their endpoints. So we're going to go start an endpoint of each line. We're going to work out where they exist on our 2D surface as UV coordinates, and then we're going to draw them on our 3D surface. Does that make sense? Easy. But we need to trim them. Because right now, we only really care about this edge. Yeah? And if we were to put all of them on, it would produce a system to, to everywhere. So this probably won't apply to Blair or people doing stuff like Blair, but you should still do this process, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our evaluate surface output and we're gonna draw an interpolated spline between the points. And what that does is it produces uh, the line edges. I've gotta be really quick. That produces the line edges so uh, if I flatten this and join the curves, what that'll do is produce a nice closed planar curve on our 2D plane. We're going to use that to cr uh, trim. And we used trim before with the cylinders. Do you remember when we used the cylinders to do a trim? Do you remember when we used cylinders to do a trim? Oh, yes. yes, okay, well, well instead of using cylinders now, we're going to use a region, so we can use trim c with region, the region being this outside curve, so that goes into the region part of our trim with region, and our removed duplicate lines are the thing that are being trimmed, and what that'll do is it'll just give us the lines that are inside. So if I hide everything, uh, that's a mess. Uh, and just to make sure that this is working, we're going to put a XY plane in here. There we go, that cleans that all up. Cool. So what that's done is it's just trimmed all those extra lines that we don't need. And that's why, remember how I was saying I don't really care if we're messy? So that's avoided the, the mess now. It's trimmed it all away. <clears throat> and <clears throat> what that will also do is that will produce a grafted list of, of all our curves. So we can, um, what we want to do is we want to flatten that and we actually then want to graft it. So what that's effectively doing is it's just getting rid of all these empty branches. The empty branches are produced because that empty branch there is representing a line that is outside the trim. Like there used to be a line there and, and there's no result of it in the trim. So it's, it's telling us, okay, that line uh, doesn't exist in the trim. If you need to gather that information later, uh, you can get it from that empty list, but we, we don't need that. So we're gonna flatten, we're gonna graft, and that's gonna produce a nice little grafted tree here. And what that will let us do is plug this into something like evaluate length or evaluate curve. Let's use evaluate length this time. And with evaluate length, we're going to find the start and end point, so zero and one. And we need to make sure that's multi-lined with this panel. Plugging that in and just making sure that the curve is reparameterized. That'll give us all the start and end points of each of these lines. 
Cool. So what that will allow us to do is we now have points. We can find a UV coordinate on a surface by having a point. We've already done it. So we can basically just copy this. Oh, no, let's not copy. Um, that's going to confuse everyone. Um, we're going to grab the surface closest point again. We're going to plug our points in 2D in. We are mapping to our 2D surface. So let's go grab that 2D surface that we made, the planar one. And we're using that as the surface to measure to. Now, just always remember we want to re-parameterize. It should, should almost be default with these components. Um, and then the opposite, the thing that we need to map that to the 3D surface is evaluate surface. So our UV coordinates go into UV. Our surface, which is this guy here, the original uh, surface, goes into the S. And we need to make sure that that's also re-parameterized. And there you go. It's been mapped. And if I look at it in 3D, there are all the points getting mapped to the 3D surface. OK? So the beautiful thing about this is that because we've grafted it, and because we've, the graft has followed through this process, what do we, what do we know about each branch? How many, how many points are in each branch? Two points. And if I were to connect two points, what would that produce? A line. So if I were to connect two points, being if I were to run a two-pointed list through a polyline script, uh, component, we would produce a line. So just, just as a note, the, I've just done this with a square grid. Now, the reason why I've shown you this process, and it's taken a little bit longer than what we would have done um, the other way, is if I now grab a hexagonal grid, um, and let's just have a look at that. No, there's no need to follow. This is more just a demonstration of how cool Grasshopper is. So you guys can see this hexagonal grid. So if I were to um, plug that into the system instead, then I would end up with a hexagonal grid on our surface. Cool? So this is basically how I did the roofs that I just showed you. Um, so all the roofs that you saw, saw in the lecture were basically uh, truncated using this process except for the Jakarta roof. Cool? OK, give me a second. So I'm going to plug, I'm going to plug our square grid back. Yes? What's the issue? Pardon? Just jump up. Uh, that just crashed. OK, remember, guys, if you save, yeah, it's going to auto. If you save early on, if it crashes, then it'll auto save it. Yeah, so uh, I just. Look at that, that was quick. Um, that is because this needs to be re Yeah, but. No, look, see. Yeah, so. You've got lines going across your, um, your thing now, um, these lines. Did you trim them? What What are you using the item for? Oh, no, no, sorry. Uh, this surface. That's the surface? Yeah. You trimmed, so that's leaving these guys. Flatten, graft, evaluate, zero, one. That's all good. So if I change the size of the grid. Yeah, only this part, but this part is Oh, Jesus, so why have you changed the colours? Why does everything have to be pink? <laughs> uh.
There's something missing, like. <laughs> yeah, I can see. Yeah. Sorry. Um. Okay, so quick and easy way to solve this for you. I'm just going to do this because your surface is just a l little bit broken, and um, so we're just going to. I'll help you out later with this. But you see, there's your there's a grid across your surface, and we're just going to create a um, polyline in one direction, and we're going to flip the matrix under tree. Flip, and we're going to produce polylines in the other. We'll explode them, flatten them, and graph them. Um, so that'll that'll give you the same. If you work, you work on the lines just as if I've. Um, the same outcome. Pretty much. So if you just work with that, that'll that'll work. Cool. Okay. That'll get you where everyone else is. It just won't do the hexagonal thing. Yes. Okay, so you can see uh, this needs this just needs to be reparameterized. See how it's now mapped that onto the surface. So see this this shape here. It's now been mapped onto this. So as you watch, as you play around with the size, see how the the one in the three D surface is moving as well. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. So we just need to work with these lines. Just keep working from this. We're, we're going to work from this point, okay? Okay. Yes. Um. That needs a two panel. Uh, this needs to. You need to say zero and one. This with this. We we're evaluating. We need an input. We need to get the start and end point of it. Yeah. And this these all need to be reparameterized. Um, but you're not doing a um, closest point on the surface. Like you've skipped that bit. We need to find where the point is on the surface. The surface needs to be reparameterized. The surface is the 2D surface, which is this one, the planar one. And the UV, oh, hang on, that's not the right one. Can you hold control shift, please? Are you holding control shift? Yeah. Control shift. Okay, you shift. And just keep holding it. And then the UVs go into there. And you can see that grid, if you create a polyline from that. You see that that's getting applied, but it's only this part. So you need to make your grid smaller. Do you see how that's getting applied to your surface? Cool. Okay. Pardon? Doesn't look like mine. Go display. Draw icons. Better? I mean, uh, I mean, my line is not similar to yours. It's, yeah. 
It's not dashed. Uh, that's because these numbers are set to ze one. So you need to produce more than one. So as these go, see, uh, as this goes, see how that now dashes? Because it's producing more than one grid. All good? Huh? I need you. <laughs> Everyone needs you right now. This mm -hmm. is an issue from this. I haven't even plugged it in yet. Yeah, what's the matter? Why can't I get rid of these? Sorry, this is something else? No, this is another problem? No, this is, sorry, this is a curve. This is the original model. The right. Right. I haven't plugged in what we've done today into the model because I haven't been this yet. Okay, well, let's just keep... Uh, we just want one of these. So we just want this guy. Yeah. So we'll just plug that in. Okay. So and we can just hide all of this okay. for now. Okay. And so we can see this has made the rectangle there, yeah. and the grid's just too big. Oh, is that what it is? It's too big. Oh, okay. So if I make that, wow, your model's tiny. <laughs> Can you type one uh, um, or five? Yeah. Ooh. And then oh, these is. these are the number like. Oh my god! All right. Okay. Okay, that also needs to be like a smaller number. Yeah. But what that's doing now is it'll it should be mapping that so so this three D surface. Yeah. Um, we need to map to the 2D surface. Oh, oops, sorry. We're mapping to the 2D surface and we're mapping onto the 3D surface. Whoop. And we can see the see how that's producing that that there. But it looks like. Can you go control? Uh, may I? Control what? I'll just I'll do it. By the way, this is my third surface model too. Really? Yeah, I don't, I don't own them. Um, so your, no, no, we don't want to do the untrimmed. We want the, the edge of the, the, that shape, because what that'll do is that that tells us where on the two D surface okay. our actual shape is. Okay. So that'll then trim our curves, and so that tells us that our grid needs to be probably. Ooh. Well, okay, so here's the grid, yeah. right? Yeah. Ah, you don't want this. You just want to plug it into one. Oh, shit. Um, and then that, then... Ah, and why are you using the list item? You don't need that. That's just That was just a demonstration from me. I should really... No, 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 it's okay. It's fine. It's all good. Uh, I need to tell people... Yeah, it's all good. There's, um... A lot of a lot of the time involved is learning how to problem yeah. solve. Yeah. Um, so if we make this a little bit smaller and let's set these to like three. A lag on this as well. well, it's because you're doing so much. So it's doing 137. Okay. Um, so let's do 10 okay. and five. Okay, yeah. I'll put in. Come on. And then we can make this a bit bigger. Okay, excellent. Okay. Cool. So now it's not working. It's not so slow. Yeah. Now what that's done is that's mapped everything onto yeah. the 3D surface, which our 3D surface looks like this. Oh, this is strange. How did that end up in the? Um. Ah, because you're not you're not you're mapping this to the 2D one, not the 3D one. So that's the 3D one. Okay. Um, no. This is the 3D surface that we want to map from and to. This is the surface that we want to map from and to. Then we're mapping from the 2D surface, which has not been reparameterized. That's it. Done. Look at that. Cool. See how it's following the thing? No problem. I don't expect you guys to do this. be able to problem solve this at the moment. Yes. Oh jeez. Yes. Sorry. Does this look bright to you? Because it's very big. Yeah, that looks fine. Okay.
Is it producing the outcome that we want? Uh, it looks like you haven't mapped it to 3D. Excuse me. So we want to go from 2D to 3D. So you can see this is our, that's our 2D surface. But look, we're mapping from our 2D surface to our 2D surface. We want to be mapping from our 3D surf, our 2D surface to our 3D surface. So plugging the 3D one in gives you the those beams mapped to oh, we're upside down to 3D. See that? Cool. So we just want to work with we're going to be working with these lines. Just these lines. But now we've got a way to put lines on the surface. Right, okay. Cool? Does that, that all make sense to everyone? Cool. Yes? Pardon? Not flatten, reparameterize. <laughs> Can I? So you're going from. You're mapping from the 2D surface to the 3D surface. That is correct. We are getting the evaluated points. Um, yep, which are those. And we're mapping them onto that surface. What does our surface look like? That's flattened. That needs to be reparameterized, not flattened. You're using the wrong symbol, man. See that 3D object now? Yeah. Done. Oh, okay. <laughs> Is it right? I don't know. Does that make sense? Reparameterize, not flatten. You're not using the right inputs. Like, see this? That's reparameterize. Yeah, that looks fine, man. It just needs, see the grid? The grid's just too big. It's not giving you enough. Like it's not giving you enough uh, detail on the model. See the see how that's got more detail now, guys. It's guys. There's something that I've been noticing. Let me just let can let me just deal with this first. So there's something I've been noticing with a few of you, and that is that the um, your outcome, guys. Your outcome looks okay. We'll just we'll just have conversations with each other. Hey guys, you two. If you need help, you should listen. Okay. A lot of the grids that I've been seeing have been coming out looking a lot like like this. That's not going to work, right? It's just not enough. So it's, your grid's probably too big. So you just need to make sure that as you're drawing a grid over your shape, we've got the shape. We know where it is. The lines that are being drawn over that shape are going to be the lines that appear on your surface. So make sure your grids are smaller because as you make them smaller, you're going to see more resolution and detail on your model. Okay? Now who's having issues? The red and yep. it's has orange lines and it's uh, sure, didn't move, it's it's walk.
There's your grid, it's tiny. That, see that red outline? That's yeah. where your surface is. Th that's my surface? Yeah. But, but my surface is not so much. There's your surface. Yeah. Ah, see these points here? Yeah. You plug the points in, not the UV coordinates. Therefore, that's your surface. That's uh, better. Then over here, done. It works. It's working. It's all good, man. Again, but I just helped you guys. I was just here. What's wrong? What's what's broken since since I've been back? Yes. Why is that orange? That needs to be flat. The C, stuff that goes into C, right click it. No, 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 the previous one. No, no, this one on the left, that C, right click it. Flatten it. Flatten. But you're plugging... You need to put a surface into that. The 2D surface needs to go into that. Yes, that one, that planar surface needs to go into there. And then 3D surface needs to go into that one. No, no, the 3D surface, the one that, the original surface. That one. Yep, uh, no, 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 to that. See the evaluate surface, what inputs does it take? The, this component, what inputs does it take? What does the S take? What, is, what input does the S require? Mouse over S, what does it say? No, no, read mouse over S. Mouse over S. Put your mouse over S. Can you... Guys, guys, can I just... Can I just make sure you understand something like blatantly, like super blatantly obvious, guys? When I ask you, when I ask you with a component, what the inputs take, okay? We have inputs through here. If I mouse over P, it tells me it wants a plane, okay? If you plug a surface into a plane, it's not going to work. If you plug a number into a plane, it's not going to work. When I ask you, what inputs does it take? That you, you don't actually have to guess. It's going to tell you, okay? So if you've got a component that's red and you've got a little bubble next to it, like this, it's going to tell me data conversion failed from integer to plane. That means it can't take planes. So if you've got a component that's red, you can probably work out by yourself why it's red, because you can mouse over the little speech bubble, it'll tell you the problem. But when I ask you, what input does this take? You don't actually need me to tell you. Grasshopper will tell you, okay? So, if you've got a surface, if you have to evaluate a surface, such as this, what input does the S take? What input is that? Right, and what is the what input is UV? Okay, so if you've got something going into the S that isn't a surface, do you think it's going to work? Okay. Is it working now? Is it working? Yeah. Okay. We all good? Everyone good? Yeah. You're not good? Dude. I haven't actually moved forward. So we fixed, I just fixed this with you. So what have you done? So orange means empty. So somewhere in here, it's, em it's empty. So these are all empty. So your grid, your grid is nowhere in this. So see this square grid? See that? That needs to be bigger, much bigger. 
Yeah, it's too small. It's too small. Yeah, so yeah. Make, can you make this grid fill small. this object? I just think it's too Yeah, it needs to be bigger. Okay. I'm moving forward. We don't have enough time. So, we've got a bunch of lines. Now, we need to make nodes from these. The most problematic part of this is going to be making nodes. Nodes are heavy geometry objects that need to be Boolean together. I don't think Boolean has been explained to you guys, but if I have two objects, let's say two cylinders, and I want them to be one object, we have to use a process called Boolean to combine the two solids together. The best way to describe Boolean is kind of like cookie dough, or yeah, cookie dough. So if I were to take, geez. If I were to take a sheet of cookie dough, that's my shape, and I grab a ball of cookie dough, and I mush it into the side, that is the equivalent of a Boolean union because I've now just made one single blob of cookie dough. If I take a cookie cutter and I cut out a shape in the cookie dough, or maybe it would be better if I cut out a shape like that, that is the, uh, and the shape that I've cut is this, what I've done is a Boolean uh, subtraction. Okay, so I've taken a shape, I've taken another shape, I've applied it, and we, we're left with this. And then the last one is a Boolean intersection. So if I were to use the cookie cutter and take the piece that the cookie cutter creates, just like you would with an actual cookie cutter, then the result is an intersection. So another diagram that would be better is this. So a uh, Boolean union will give us an uh, uh, eight shape, yeah? A Boolean in, uh, subtraction will give us the shape on the left at that point, and a Boolean uh, intersection will give us this middle Venn diagram overlap, okay? So if we union two things together, it'll, it'll join them. But union breaks a lot, and uh, it is also a very slow process. But I think we're going to have to use it today because we just don't have time to explain how I would do it without using Boolean. It's just a, a, way more complex. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to make our nodes. And the nodes need to happen at the ends of each of these lines, okay? So really simple, easy way to do this. A way that I don't need to explain because I've already explained how to do it in the past is if we shatter our polylines. So if I just hide everything, take our polylines and shatter them, the coordinate that I want to shatter at is going to be a number between 0 and 1 because I don't think I need to explain what shatter does anymore. Is that right? Everyone knows shatter? Good. Okay, so if I want to shatter at point 2, then I want to, I'm going to actually shatter on the other side. So we want a 1 minus point 2 as well. And you'll see why very soon. So the two numbers that we want to shatter by are point 0.2 and point 0.797. So if we plug these two numbers in, so this is a point where we want to hold shift. And as always, when we're using a number between 0 and 1, we want to make sure that it's reparameterized. You guys, will, I think you're going to eventually work out when to reparameterize and when not to. But usually when we're using this, we want to reparameterize. What that'll do is that, that'll give us three lines. And we only want the first one and the last one. So we, we can get rid of these by either dispatching or culling. So if we use cull index, we just need to cull uh, the zero in, uh, sorry, the one index. And that'll produce something like this. 
Uh, okay, let me just backtrack on that one because that's going to fail. That's going to fail miserably for some of these. Okay, hold up. Okay, so if I have a line, uh, if I have a line that's 10 meters long and I set this to uh, 0.1, how long is my node going to be? Yeah, So, but then if I have a line that's uh, 10 millimeters long, how long is my node going to be? Right, so if I've got a system that has a 10 meter one and a 10 millimeter one, what's going to happen? I'm going to end up with really weird sized nodes. So we need our nodes to be the same size and we need a system that also gets rid of nodes that might be too small. And so what we're going to do then is we are going to, instead of using the shatter, sorry, let's get rid of that, my bad. Sorry, so we go back to our polyline instead of using that. Um, sometimes I make mistakes. Um, we want to use extend. Uh, the beautiful secret thing about extend is if you put a negative number into the L0 and L1, then what it does is instead of extending it is it trims it. So what we're going to do is we are going to plug a negative number. So we'll go grab the negative uh, maths component. We'll grab a number. Um, let's make that 10. And then we're going to plug that into both. And what you might discover is as you slide that up, this component goes red. Now, why is it going red? The negative extension length is longer than the curve. So I've got a curve here that is longer than 2 mil. That's good. What that means is I'm getting rid of that curve. So we, we want to get rid of it. Excellent. So what you'll see is this is actually producing a gap in between our lines. But what we're going to do is we're going to grab the start and end point of our polyline and the start and end point of our extended curve. And uh, sorry, before we do that, we just need to clean out uh, any of our polylines that got broken. Um, and the quick and easy way of doing that is grabbing a null item component, plugging that in. That's just testing if something's broken. I don't expect you guys to really understand what this does. It's just avoiding any problem here. We want to dispatch based on that. We plug our polyline into the dispatch and we want all the outputs coming out of B. And so what that's going to do is just get rid of any of the broken lines. So polyline goes into our extend. We're testing for null items. We're, dispatch, we're dispatching based on the null item. And we're getting the, the polylines dispatched based on that true false value. Then we're getting the start and end points of our extended curve. We're getting the start and end points of our dispatched curves. And we are going to draw lines between the start and start and the end and end, leaving us with this should work, giving us the like giving us these lines here that are the nodes. We'll, we'll end up controlling the nodes. Okay, so these are the these are the points that change direction in the model. Yeah. Right. I've got an hour and twenty minutes. We can do it. So. Each of, each of these, these can actually start, go into a single list now. So we can put these into a big flat list. And we're going to give them de uh, width. So we're going to pipe them. Now pipe is actually a really labor intensive process for Grasshopper. So just be careful with this. There are ways of getting around it. But if I pipe this and then set it to a radius. Now if I were to, so pipe is just basically putting a little tube around a line. If I 
I'm using a five mil uh, radius, no, diameter, using a five mil diameter uh, bamboo ch tube, and we're going to 3D print a socket for that to go into. That means we need a thickness to our uh, socket wall. What's the minimum thickness that a wall can be with the 3D printers? Two mil. Okay. So we need. So if we have a five mil, if we have five mils for the uh, bamboo diameter, the the bamboo's diameter is five mil. You're gonna you're gonna plug bamboo into a socket, right? Imagine this is your node, guys. Imagine this is your node, and I know this is quite um, adult entertainment. But this is our bamboo, and we plug it in, right? The bamboo is going to be five mil in diameter. So it's actually quite um, thick, yeah? And it's going into a socket that needs to be five mils wide, basically. We want to add a little bit of tolerance, but if we're going to 3D print the socket, what thickness does the wall need to be? Roughly two mil to be safe? Okay. So. If we want to turn diameter into radius, what do we usually, what do we have to do? We divide by two, and so, and then we want to add y, which is the thickness. So what this is giving us is a five mil plus a, uh, sorry, 2.5 mil plus two, which will then, whoop, we want this to be, uh, Printer wall thickness, and we're going to plug that into our radius, which will then give us <clears throat> basically the the ma maximum size that we require for the for the um, the joint. Now this this is actually going to create um, some pretty funky geometry because as you can see, um, it's not it's not going to be that clean around the edges. So what, what we're going to do, see the E value of pipe? If you set that to 2, so if we put the number 2 into E, what it does is it actually gives you a round edge to the pipe. Because if you mouse over E, it says, specifies, this parameter specifies the type of cap where zero is none, one equals flat, and two equals round. So two is giving us a round edge. Cool? So what that'll do is it'll make sure that the... Something's funny. Broken. Ah, oh, because your, um, your model's so tiny. So just what you can do, if you just grab... If you grab the lines, these polylines, and you scale them, so just grab what uh, if you just grab a transform uh, scale um, and then plug your lines into that and then just set a fact the factor is going to be the thing that helps control that. So if you set that to like if it needs to be ten times bigger, then um, we can put a slider in. Or uh, so if I set this slider to ten, then that uh, what it will mean is you can scale it up so that it's actually workable and you can see this is actually running quite slowly now and that's because of the bloody pipe so so I'm going to set this to let's make it two times bigger cool okay so imagine these pipes are made of cookie dough these are actually four there's four of them one two three four yeah so what we need to do is we need to get the pipe and union them together and I'm going to save this script because um, because this is the point where Grasshopper might crash. Okay guys? So all of you save. Uh, and something that's important as you plug this into the solid union 
um, is that you, we will need to flatten it. So what, what I'll do is I'll just flatten it, I'll save it, and then I'll plug it into the Solid Union, and we will break Grasshopper. Currently, no. At the moment, no. I can't. I will once it's finished. It, so this took 30 seconds. And what we'll note, just note here, see how this is, um, it's, uh, it said Boolean union set is empty. So it took 30 seconds to break. Excellent. So let's turn that off. That's not going to work. Um, what, where do you need? Sarah? Uh, this one? Uh, union. How do we fix union? Okay, I think it might, what might be hurting it is the rounded ends. So if we set that to one to at least cap it, um, I'll see what happens. Please work. No, it still broke. Okay, so, guys, let's just, let's just ignore the Boolean function f for now. The key thing here is we need to produce, we need to produce a hole in our node, which needs to be done with a Boolean. Okay, so what, what we have is we have a node here that is 10 mils to the center, but we need to punch a hole in it. But the hole, do you, the hole doesn't necessarily need to go all the way through, okay? So what we need to do is produce another extend curve, but this extend curve needs to have a smaller number to it. So let's say if we did a 10 mil node, then we'll do a five mil beam, so then, what we need to do is this this beam is effectively going to be our bamboo okay so <clears throat> so the we've got a five mil bamboo element and this takes radius so we need to divide that by two aren't you glad i told you to save eileen Aren't you glad I, I did it crash? Yeah, it crashed. The one that I had, I saved it twice. Right. And the one that I last saved wouldn't have been good. So I think I saved it twice. Right. Yeah. 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 So if I plug in, so if I plug in our, if I plug in um, the bamboo, so you see, see what we're trying to produce in a way? So we've got nodes and then we've got pipes in between them. <laughs> yeah? But we, we just need to make sure that the, these little piped uh, rods, guys, we need to make sure that these little piped rods are now cutting out the, into the node. So fortunately, the nodes that we have here, uh, no, that's not going to work. Shit. Shit, shit, shit. So see this flattened tree? We want to get rid of that because we need to... We need to maintain the branch structure. So what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of the flattened tree. We're going to use merge instead um, to pipe. Um, so what that will mean is there will be at least two, there should be two pipes per, if we simplify the lines as they come out, there should be two pipes per, why is there more than one? 
Oh, that's why. Okay, so there should be two pipes coming out of our merge. I mean, sorry, two lines coming out of our merge into the pipe. The pipe is producing, uh, it's branching each of the, the lines for, for, I feel like, no good reason. So just to clean that up, to get it back to the same data structure, we need to use trim tree. So trim tree will get that back to two per list. So that's going to be the same, hopefully, as uh, the two per list that we will have, oh, the, sorry, the one per list that we have uh, from the, the, this pipe. So we have a trimmed tree and pipe. So what that means is this trimmed tree is the node on the top of the, the rod and the bottom. And we then need to intersect using Boolean. This time we're going to use solid difference. Let's all make sure that we save. Done. So we need to cut from our two surfaces, our piped surface. And then we need to make sure that this is all set, uh, the end caps are all set to one. And it's broken. Well, it's broken. Uh, uh, no, that's working. OK, so that's all now producing um, these little 3D um, pipe geometries. Cool. So guys, you gotta, you got to make sure that this number here, the one that you're um, negatively trimming, is bigger. It should really be bigger than the radius of the, the full set. So this should be like six, at least six. Guys, this should be at least six. Because what it's doing is it's avoiding any clashing that you've got with the with the um, the other directions, and then uh, I would probably set the extension of your node to be at least maybe 15 millimeters, just so that it's um, just so that you've got a bit of purchase, so that there's a bit of depth to your socket. Okay. So. Um, Avoiding, now th this is where I, I'd really like you guys to start working this out. You guys can probably, um, I, you might be able to 3D print this without actually unioning them together. Um, but if you, if you do want to try unioning them together, um, you can always do the solid union. Um, if that doesn't work, then you can uh, convert them to a mesh. So if you create a mesh BREP from these, um, and then with the mesh BREP, you can try a Boolean uh, mesh union instead. Let's actually try that. Save that. Oh, it worked. Look at that. Yeah. Well, let's try that. Let's try meshing them all, um, doing a, then doing a Boolean mesh union, um, and that should produce uh, the, the outcomes that we need. Let's see if that actually works with a, N, a rounded end cap for the uh, node pipe. Please work. Guess what? We're pretty much almost there. <laughs> Frozen as in it's calculating? Uh, I don't know, still that spinning wheel. Yeah, look, look, I've got my spinning wheel too. So we're in the same boat. <laughs> so guys, guys, the more nodes you do, the longer it's going to take. You can see why I try and avoid doing booleans. They take a lot of time, and uh, some like when I draw a. Oh, what's going on there? Yeah, let's turn that off. Um, when I draw something for a builder, um, I don't actually have to three D print it. They're the ones that have to do like have to build it. So a lot of the time, we don't even do unions. We just um, draw our beams col colliding and leave it at that. 
Okay? Okay, so we're at a point now where we actually have these lines here, the ones that we've used to bull in, they're actually the lines that we could be using to create the bamboo. We can just measure the lengths of them and create bamboo for them. So, so guys, if we just plug this into a nice flat set, a flat list, and we measure the lengths of each of the lines. So we get the lengths. We should be getting a nice list of all the different lengths that we need to cut. Do you see where I'm, do you see how I was warning you about um, like how do you cut 87.42? Or how do you cut 119.346201? Like, they're just values that we don't care about, right? But if I were to start simplifying these, which direction would we want to simplify? It, like, how, how could you simplify a number like this? What's one way of doing it? Rounding it, right? So most of you are aware of rounding. So, Blair, what's 13.4 rounded? You don't know. Come on, Blair. Do you know the function rounding? You don't know rounding? So if I have 13.4 and I told you that the rounding function would produce 13, and if I had 14.6 and I told you a rounding function would produce 15, what, does that make sense to you guys? Does everyone aware of rounding? Yes? Okay, good. Okay, but the problem with rounding is if I have 15.3 or 44.6 and I round that, I know you guys can't see it, but it says 44.6. Um, if I have 44.6 and round it, which direction will it go? It will become 45, which is making the line longer, yeah? Now these lines are going from they but like from the butt end of our node to the butt end of our node, right? So if we make our lines longer, we standardize them to a longer length, that's going to cause issues, yeah? Because it's going to be too long. So if we want to if we want to standardize these, they're only allowed to get shorter, not longer. Okay? So there are maths functions that do that. We can the, those mass functions are, so we have rounding, there is ceiling, and floor. So have a guess at what ceiling does. It always rounds up. So 14.2 becomes 15. And floor will always round down. So 14.9 will become 14. Okay? But... Do you guys, we, we're going to create a nice standard list of lengths uh, and we want to do that within like a truncated set, okay? So one mil is probably not enough because if I, if I just round down, actually, so what I'll do, I'll just show you guys. So if we round down, we'll just do a, um, we'll do, do this now. So rounding down being floor in an expression x. Do we have nulls in here? Yeah. Okay, guys, just before you do that, in the flattened tree, just after the flattened tree, just run that through a clean tree, which is the, um, the saw. So that, that goes into the T. Uh, that'll just get rid of all the empty, empty lists, uh, empty items. So if we've got, see how we've got all these um, elements that have been rounded to the nearest millimeter? If I count... If I count the number of that now, um, the way I would do that is by creating a set. No one here is, no one's been explained what a set is. Okay, so a set, a set is a list of items, but the special, uh, the special aspect to a set is that no item uh, can be the same. 
in the list. So if I put the number 1, 2, 1 into a list, it's not a set, okay? A set can only be 1, 2, 3, let's say. So if I put a list that has uh, uh, 116 and 116 and I create a set from that, it'll cull all the duplicates of that list, of that particular length. So we can do that with create set. So by plugging in a list, what that does is it produces 30 different lengths. I can, we've got every number in here is unique and there's 30 of them, one of them being zero. So there's technically 29, yeah? I can't. You get it? The, this is being recorded. This is being recorded. Just to double check, it's still recording. We're all good. It's being recorded. Okay. So this is creating a set, but this is only telling us the different types. So if we were to make a jig for this, how many jigs would we have to make? How many times would we have to set a new length for the jig? 29 times. 29 times, right? So what we can do is we can start saying, okay, let's, instead of crunching it to the nearest millimeter, let's crunch it to the nearest five millimeters. Okay? So um, now Christina's asked us to do it with domains, but I'm not sure, like, it's, there's actually just some quick maths functions to do it. Let's just see what she's done. Okay, so the easy way is if we were to, see how we've done a floor? All we need to do is a floor that has a new value in it, which is a factor that we're truncating to. So that factor, let's say, will be five. So every five millimeters, we want it to round, we want it to, round to five. So, sorry, we want to round down. So we'll set this to five. We're going to plug that into the Y. Guys, so the function that we want to do is we want to divide X by, by 5. Guys, we want to divide X by 5. So if, if I had the number 12 and I divided by 5, roughly what would I get? 2.4, right? So then, if I, if I took 2.4, really? 2 point, it'd be 2.2. 2. So I took, if I took 12 and I divided by 5, I get roughly 2.2, 2, roughly. Oh, yeah, you're right, 2.4. My bad. We get 2.4, right? Then if I floor that, that'll become 2, yeah? Then if I times that back by 5, 2 times 5 is 10, which is that number rounded down to the nearest 5, yeah? So all we need to do is go x divided by y, x being 12 divided by 5. We need to floor that number and then times that number by 5. So it's floor bracket x divided by y bracket times y. So what that'll do, that'll give us all of our numbers rounded to the nearest 5, which if we were to plug that into our set now, we are now getting 18. Cool, so we've culled it. We've got rid of 10 different sets, yeah? You only have two now. Maybe your model's too small. Maybe. So guys, as we up this variable, so if I set this to the nearest 10 millimeters, we're going to start removing elements from the list. So now we've only got 11. Yeah? But just remember, if we go to the nearest 10, that means 
that our, our bamboo line is going to get at least 10 mil shorter on each side, yeah? Sorry, it's going to get 5 mil shorter on each side, yeah? Right? Because we're taking 5 mil off one end, at least 5 mil, I mean, maximum 5 mil off one end and 5 mil off the other. And what we, we just need to make, the reason why we made this socket long enough was so that if we cut 5 mil off of it, the socket still is holding on to the tube. Does that make sense? Cool. Okay. So that's giving us that's giving us a list of all the the lines, right? So what we can do is we can start coloring our lines based on uh, what length they are, but in this list. So if I were to create this, this is important for later, and we we will use this very soon, but we're just going to put this off to the side. What we're going to do is use the numbers that we've got here, and we're going to create a max, min max bounds of this number. It's So we're getting the domain. So what's the shortest line that we've got? Zero. And the longest line we've got is 110 mil, roughly this big, yeah? Roughly. So if we, there's this cool little component called gradient. And if you right click gradient and change the preset, I really like this one, the red to blue. So you can right click the gradient and you can change the colors. We can move the, the colors around. We can make whatever gradient we want. <clears throat> so the key thing with this is it takes a value and it takes a minimum and maximum. So the L0 is the value on the left and the L1 is the value on the right. So what we can do is we can use the min max bounds to grab the, uh, and we can grab the, the minimum and maximum with a deconstruct domain. So the start and end value will go into the start and end of the, the gradient. And all of our numbers that we've calculated can go into T. And what this will produce is a color based on where that number sits between those boundaries in the gradient. So these colors are in RGB values. So 2, 3, 4, 6, 4, and 0 um, to me looks like uh, red. It's a red. Because it's two. So these are RGB, R. GB. Important thing is, if we were to then grab a display, a custom preview. So if we use custom preview, we can plug our lines being these flattened ones uh, after they've been cleaned up. So if we plug our cleaned up lines into the G component and we plug our colors into M. What that'll do if I hide everything but those colors guys, is that'll show us the color map of all the lengths. And so uh, the zero has fucked up the system because it's, it's just too strongly against blue. But what we, what we can do is if we just plug, uh, how do we get rid of zero? Uh, if we grab a slider and set that to 110 or whatever, no, we don't want to do that. That's just that's giving us a color map. So if I set this to the rainbow one, it's going to give us a lot of red. So uh, we can see that most of my most of my beams are actually the same length, right? They're all red. So this is actually, this is going to be quite easy to build, I find. So, we're getting a color gradient of all of our lengths. If I, let's find out. Yeah, I've seen, we've seemed to make this all uh, fairly easy to make. We've made them all the same size. Is everyone getting similar colors? 
No? No, I'm not. You're not there. Okay, that's fine. The point is you can follow this video, right? Is it recorded though? It's being recorded. Wow. It is being recorded. Good. So, the, the important thing here is that we can see a map of where all the where all these beams are being used, okay? So, what we've got here is we've got a list of all the different lengths of beam, yeah? But now we need to know how many of that type is in the list. And so, the component that will do that is our... Um, do we just want to sort these, by the way? Do you want them in order? Okay. So. We'll just use this uh, sort list. Um, so with the sort list, uh, the important thing here is we just need to make sure uh, uh, that when we plug our value in, so this is now sorting all our numbers from 0 to, to 110. Um, oh, no, no, that's it. Yeah, we just sort it, then plug it into the create set. So that now all of our set values are going from 0 to 110. Cool. And then the last thing that we need to do is grab the member index. So what this thing does is if you give it a value, so for example, if we get it, give it zero, it will look for the zero in the list. So we can see there's two and it will output the index of that value uh, into a list. Now we don't technically need to know what the index is what we need to know is the length, the length. So if we get the list length, this guy here, that'll give us the number of elements that with that length. So you can see here we've only got uh, one of the second item and two of the third. And the very last item we've got 72. Cool? So that's why we're seeing all those reds in that, that color, colored system. So just to quickly create a nice little um, a nice little map, like a list for you guys to cut, let's use format. And format's actually the thing that uh, will appear when you grab an expression. So when you grab an, when you grab this, you can see it says format. What that's doing is it's formatting the text. Um, it's taking inputs. So within the format, we're going to have zero comma one so what we're going to do is we're going to put a little times instead of the comma space one and what we'll do is we'll plug in the list length values into x and we will plug in our set into y and that will give us a list where it says we want two times zero actually let's in the expression let's also put mm after the one so we want 2 times 0 millimetres, 1 times 10 millimetres, 2 times 20 millimetres, 4 times 30 mil, down to 72 times 110. Does that make sense? So this is what you would use to make all the elements. Yep. Now, I feel like this colour system is not helping. Like, if you were to look at your digital model and you have all your pieces like a IKEA set, and you need to work out where they need to go, it's going to be really hard to work out where they go, right? Like, you don't know if you need the 20 mil, like a color doesn't mean 20 mil, right? So another way to do this, instead of using colors, is if you grab the, let's say, the center point of the lines, so with the evaluate length, we can use this point to put a piece of text. So if we go display, see how we've got text tag? So text tag, will, we need a location. So P becomes our location. And then the length of the line, so being the, this thing coming out of the expression, can go into the T. And you can see now that's put all the numbers on each, each of the uh, beams. So we can see this one is 80, this one's the 30. Where's our zero? 
There, there's our two zero lengths. So that can be used that can be used to help assemble the model once you've finished, right? So you've got a list. This will give you a list of lengths to cut and it'll give you uh, these elements here that you can use to 3D print. And it is highly likely that these are going to print support structure inside the plug. So you're going to need to drill them out. So important thing to note, the length of the socket should at least be long enough to handle the truncation that you use. So if you're reducing it by 10 to the nearest 10, this should at least be five, at least five, probably uh, five plus one, so six, just so it's got at least one mil to hold on to. Cool? But this is pretty much like a, how we work when we start drawing structure. The lecture that I did today, you would have seen a lot of beams. Those are really just defined as single lines. And that's all I need to actually work out. I put a profile on them that gives it depth, but I rarely actually have to spend time uh, modeling the way that the two beams come, come together. They usually clash. That's something that we can work out later on. Like getting that right's not necessarily important early on in the process. It's only important once the, two, the guy doing the steel work actually has to get those two elements to join together. And there are, there are different reasons why we use different beams as well. So um, we use CHSs, which are circular hollow sections, which are effectively two uh, pipes or two cylinders. The cool thing about two cylinders of the same radius is they can always miter up and join up with the same section. So that's really useful. Yes. You put your hand up. Okay, yeah, yeah, so this is this is where it comes really difficult, right? So what what I would do I would do with my 3D printer is I would actually etch onto them the name of each one. I'd give them each a name, but I don't think the printer here is actually capable of doing that amount of detail. So I'm gonna leave it up to you guys to organize it. <laughs> Well, the thing is, so, okay, one little trick. There's a component under transform called, uh, I've forgotten what it's called. This one, called move to plane. So if you plug all your elements into the move to plane, it, it puts them on the ground, like so. So at least they're like touching the, the floor. I would then bake it and then organize them in a way that you will find. So it, what you could do is put them in lines on the 3D printer. And so you know that as you pull them off the 3D printer, the these guys are for the one rot line, the second line, the second line. Now this, this also gets really interesting when, as I, as we showed before, if I plug this guy in, and we wait. It's not going to crash. It's just thinking. Yeah. So this is now a hexagonal grid structure. And we're getting a, it's producing for us the cutting list. So we need. 37, 60 mil, 120, 50, 14, 40, et cetera, et cetera. So we can, like, once you get the script to produce for you this, you can actually start changing your design to make it easier for you to build. Yeah? Because fuck this. So, Andrew, is that only called one size thing I don't need to? We just need to cut each, each yeah, of that so same size. But it would be good to do this. Yeah. It, it, is it telling you that they're all the yeah, same size? Excellent. That means you've worked out 
that you can make everything one size. That's good. Yeah. So you can see, like, it, this gets a lot more complicated when you're doing more than just beams. Like, how do you work out where, that a triangle, how do you work out that that triangle is the same triangle as the next one? Or within, like, a certain uh, dimension? It gets really difficult doing that because you can't just take the length of it and truncate it. So, but that's, you guys don't have to do that. You won't have to do that throughout the whole uni degree. So that's fine. No, no. If you, if you can, if it's a little challenge that you want to go through your head, if you want to come and ask me, hey, Andrew, I would do it this way, I'll tell you if that's the same way that I did it once. Yeah, I've done, so I have done, I've had to, standardized triangles and I fortunately proved to the people that standardizing them would actually cost more than not standardizing them because what it, they, they had a little rubber gasket in between them and it would actually mean that the rubber gasket would have to be a variable size between each triangle and making a custom variable gasket is more expensive than making a uh, standard panel. So we were able to avoid that, but there's still there's a really cool process that you can use to work out whether or not like standardizing triangles, and it involves the properties of a triangle. I rushed very quickly, and we've now got 35 minutes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the recording and make sure that it's saved. <coughs> Let me just make sure that it's saved. Yep, it's... Yes, it is saved. <laughs> now, it takes me forever to upload this to YouTube. Sorry. It just takes a long time. Okay, you have questions? You have problems? Okay. <laughs> Billy's got to the point where he, he, think he can just lie on the table. That's... <laughs>